Hello, 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 Grid Network. Um, it, this is Danielle Plesky Brown, uh, and I am an agent and investor in the uh, DC area. And I am here with Raj Tamang, my co host, a custom home builder as well as structural engineer. And we are here for, to start our new series because we just finished our construction series. So, for anyone interested, go back and watch 15 or 16 episodes, I forget of exactly how to build a house from scratch. But now today we are starting our new series, Construction Estimating. Um, some of the most comments and questions we've gotten from you guys and feedback has been, well, how do I know what it's gonna cost me? Or I wanna do renovations on my house in this section. Like, well, how do I estimate that? Well, we're gonna go through step mm -hmm. by step how to do that in different phases, different components of a property. And we're gonna start just like we did in their construction series, um, from the foundation up, from the lot up also. I guess we can also talk about land value and how to estimate that at a different time. Um, right. But today we start with new construction estimate part one. Uh, we're gonna do site conditions. Um, so Raj, what are some of the first things when con uh, considering a project, right? Like we were even just talking about one right before we got on, on here. Mm -hmm. When considering buying a lot, uh, what are things that you look at to start estimating what it's going to take to build on that property. Yeah, um, you know, so there are three different there are three different scenarios I look at. First of all, yeah. let's say you have a design, you have a feasibility study. We talk about this in the beginning, I don't know, six months ago when we started this series. Um, you have a feasibility study, you have a design phase, right? And they have construction phase and you have a conclusion phase, which is part of the construction phase. So when you show feasibility study, that's the time you have to do all the study of the lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, because of building a house, your construction cost to build a house is there, but then you have to think about other costs associated with it. For example, a design cost, we'll talk about that later. I think that's on the third series of this construction estimating. Mm -hmm. um, series. Um, but that's a design cost, which is soft cost. You also have to keep in mind, right? That's could yeah. be a significant amount depending on what type of house you do, especially custom homes. Um, the specific site condition, I'll give you an example, especially in our area, Northern Virginia, um, we have a basement, right? Pretty much all new construction, we have a basement. Um, that means you have to dig out the dirt, right? If it is a fully buried basement, if you are lucky, maybe you have a you know walkout basement on the back. But it's most likely you have a fully buried basement if it's flat ground, which is desirable. Flat ground mm -hmm. is desirable. The problem then you have to have a fully buried basement. The basement is below ground. Okay. So 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 let's say you have a you know three-story building, basement floor, first floor, and second floor. Uh, the basement is underground, so fully buried. When you have fully buried, you have to, we talked about this one before, is that the dirt you have to dig out or excavate, right? Uh, yeah. When digging the basement out, that needs to be, if it is a big lot, for example, you have, you know, four or five acre lot, you know, space, you have a plenty of space to throw away or keep the dirt in the, on the side, you can. Um, mm -hmm. as long as the grading plan allows or site condition allowed, but typically spec homes I'm doing here, Mucklin Falls as Vienna, this is like half acre to quarter acre, quarter acre lot. Even in Arlington, you and I were talking, it's not quarter acre lot, it's just that 5,000 square feet lot, right? Yeah, it's, where does all that dirt go? Exactly, like, all the dirt, you have to throw it away, right? And that is almost $250 per truck. Um, oh wait, so for per truckload. Okay, so that's per truckload. That's an interesting So 250 bucks for a truckload of dirt to be taken away. Not given to you, but to be taken away. So bring okay. it now. You can bring it because everybody will give you. Yeah, the, you can get it. You can go to the construction site. Can I get the dirt? If they are if they are digging out, they will. But when you have to throw it away, then that's what you have to pay, typically. Yeah. Um so so any house, let's say you have a six, 7,000 square foot home basement, um, maybe basement is about 200 to 2,500 square feet. Maybe you're almost like 100, I don't know, 75 to 100 trucks, right? Yeah. So 100 oh. times, 
Yeah, it's a lot of dirt. So 100 times 210 is $21,000. Wow. Mm -hmm. To move dirt, not to move get dirt. dirt, to get yeah. rid of dirt. Exactly. Get rid of that dirt because you can't keep it on the side. You don't no. have it. Right. So, well, um, and but so I guess some lots that actually have the space, you can keep it to the side. But like when you're dealing with these smaller lots in more populated or like urbanized areas, that's not really an option. And you kind of have to get rid of the dirt as you go because it's not like you can even wait a day or two. What are you going to do? Block a whole road or an alley? Like you have to get rid of it then. Yeah. They want the county won't let you do it because when you have a grading plan, any new construction you have to have a grading plan, right? For the grading yeah. plan, civil engineer has to show the location. They call it stockpile because when you have a demo, um, you have some of the stuff coming out from a demoing the old house. You have the place for temporary stockpile. Um, yeah. Especially dirt, there is no space for the stockpile and. Sometimes you say, hey, can I keep it? And then later on, after house is com completed, I can use it towards the back or maybe on the side. But then for how long and where are you going to keep that dirt? You know, you don't really have a space, right? Wow. Okay. So planning on whatever you're building on that topography, how are we moving the dirt and what's it going to cost? What's the effort behind and the cost behind moving that dirt if needed? Yeah. So like I said, if it is fully buried basement, you're talking about 15 to 20 grand at least for, for you know, six, 7,000 square foot homes. Now, okay, so if you have a whack out basement, maybe you only have, see? So instead mm. of paying 20 grand, maybe you only pay 10 grand or maybe five grand. So of course I would prefer whack out basement. And also the benefit of whack out basement is you have a natural light coming from the back. Yep. And right? it doesn't feel like a basement. It feels yeah. much more just like the lower or lowest floor rather yeah. than, you know, being subterrain, which has its own challenges, right? Like humidifiers or dehumidifying, like it, the, the use of those finished spaces overall can be quite yeah. different, but it does add an entire floor of space to a home. Like if you have um, height, building height restrictions, which most of the DMV area does how high you can build, especially for a single family residence. A basement has been giving, uh, for years, people have been adding basements to their homes because it gives them a lot of extra usable square footage. So yeah. it's figuring out like what's the cost versus the benefit and also what is really expected in that area. Does every other house have a basement? Then you may want to consider that. Like if it's expected from the buyer, Mm -hmm. um, not including that could really cost you a lot in the end. Like you think the cost of a basement is a lot, the cost of losing really qualified buyers, that might be a lot more. It is, but even down the road, when you're ready to sell, you are not going to live on the house forever. Yeah. Those are the things you have to keep in mind. So that's why people, when they call me, Hey, I want to build a house. How, how much is going to cost me? Uh, how much your dollar per square feet? Um, and when I say, yeah, there is, there is no definite number, I can tell them, usually I say, okay, it could be $150, $200 per square feet just to build a house. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember there are other, other costs which is not included is I can't tell you because I need a grading plan. You know, yeah. I don't know what kind of, what, if this is fully buried basement, I can tell you this much. And again, how many trees? I don't know. You have a two or three days. It's like two or $3,000 per tree. Mm -hmm. So five, yeah. you know, five. If you have a three trees, you have to, uh, you know, cut down or remove. That's like five, six thousand dollars. That cost is added. The builder is not going to do it from their pocket. You have to, you have to do it wow. as a homeowner, right? Your client. Oh, yeah. So those are the all added cost. I call mm -hmm. site cost and engineering cost. So engineering and the you know design cost, which is permit. Permit also county will charge you almost like five, ten grand depending on. The size of the house and what you're building yeah. uh, if it's arlington even more um yeah a lot more <laughs> a lot more uh so those are the costs they can yeah they, you have to you have to look into it so i would say when you talk to the builder um and uh, say you are trying to build a house these are the things probably you have to ask hey somebody say I, I, i'm gonna you know i'm gonna charge 150 dollars per square feet charge you oh, what is included what is not included so i bet my experience, the builder cost would not include this dirt removal cost. Mm 
which is like I said, you know, like 15 to 20. I mean, a lot of <laughs> exactly. 15, you yeah. know, you're talking about, you know, 15 or 2,500 square feet basement. So if you do big, even more, right? So, yeah. And or sometimes if you need to build egresses, if you need to build staircases, windows, like all of those are also square footage that you need. And yeah, you dug exactly. out. Exactly. So let's say, assuming you have a flat ground to easy, how about the ground is not flat? Maybe it's sloping down, which is walkout basement. Maybe you have to mm -hmm. build some retaining walls. That's an additional cost because, you know, last year, no, two years ago, I built two homes in Falls or McLean High School. Both of them had a retaining wall. Um, I thought I'm a builder, I'm an engineer. This is a piece of cave. Yeah, it's a piece of cave in the paper, but <laughs> I had to build it. Um, I probably spent more than 50 grand on the time and worth. When you have a retaining wall, if this is a side to structure, you have to get separate permit. The building permit does not include it. So you have to yeah. get a ready, you know, great separate um, side to structure permit drawings. If it's retaining walls are higher than four feet. Um, so then that's an additional cost, the fees and time. And uh, especially for me as a spec home builders, my project is delayed another two or three months because of the retaining wall means I'm paying yeah. interest to the bank. So, <laughs> um, so now you're paying a lot of interest to move dirt. To move dirt. <laughs> and move exactly, dirt. you are paying more dirt because now because yeah. of retaining wall, it's almost called some kind of sunken uh, patio. If you heard a sunken patio, yep. uh, sometimes people do it, but when you do sunken patio situation, um, then all the dirt you have to pay for the dirt and also concrete structure you have to build. Yes, so that's two. Sure. And also you have to get a permit that even though it's not like hundreds of thousands, that are a few thousand dollars that adds up on your budget. Yep. And if anyone has any more questions about this specifically, Raj and I dove deep into this about a month ago, like so three or four episodes ago mm -hmm. um, on retaining walls and outdoor spaces. I think it was in outdoor structures and outdoor spaces part one in our previous series so don't feel don't hesitate to go back to that yeah. um and we go into detail about how to do all of this and uh why the benefits of this are but retaining walls like they can be really small or they could be massive costs right like i right. i had uh been working on a project in mclean i did massive home like three quarters of an acre home like lot and the backyard was, it had to be way steeper than 45 degrees, like yeah. 70 degree, like basically stairway to heaven kind of a situation. <laughs> and it had a series of these retaining walls, which they had turned into planters. And it, it kind of felt a little bit like you were in an amphitheater. And at the very, very top of this, which is easily two stories up, there was yeah. like another flat level that they had up there, but it made the sunken living room effect feel very uh, exaggerated, but that was the best use of that space for there. So I can't even imagine what it would have <laughs> what it would have cost to build something that had it must have had eight retaining walls within one. It was steps, like you know how like the gardening yeah. steps in Nepal. Like, yeah, that's what it looked like. <laughs> it was <laughs> that extreme, and I it had to be at least two and a half or three stories of stairs going to the top of it. What would it take to do something like that? So like what, what costs or what algorithms do you kind of use in your head when trying to look, when you look at the topography and you go, okay, how do I fix this? Or what am I going to have to do to meet code requirements? Like, are there any algorithms that you use? Like in your head, not necessarily in the, on the computer. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit tricky, but for example, yeah, depending on the slope, if it's really steep slope, steep slope, and you say, okay, maybe you have to build 10 foot retaining wall or 15 foot retaining wall, you can, you know, do. So usually a rule of thumb for a retaining wall, cantilever retaining wall, the footing, you have, let's say 10 foot retaining wall. So then you have a concrete footing, almost the same height, same width. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a building foundation wall house. You have a 10 foot basement or nine foot basement. Your footing is maybe 24, 25 inch or 26 inch wide only. But the retaining wall is different. If you have a 10 foot retaining wall, your footing is almost like 10 foot wide. So, mm -hmm. so you are adding a lot of concrete, uh, a lot of reinforcement. So the cost estimation is very tricky. So 
you know, from the past experience, you probably can do it. Maybe this one's retaining wall, but there is no dollar per square foot on personality to estimate the retaining wall cost. And also retaining wall, there are different types of retaining walls. Sometimes you have concrete, you have a masonry blocks. If it is really tall, I would recommend with the concrete, they are more, uh, you know, stronger, you know, but I've seen some of them, those exposed stone, you know, mm. you can do it too. So it's, I, I, it's a, I don't know what you call it, but there's a way. So instead of see 10 foot concrete wall on the back of the house, it may look, it may not look nice. So what they do sometimes they can do a step, step, you know, you have a five yeah. foot tall and three foot, three foot and build out of a big uh, stone rocks. So it's, it's, you know, it's better from a landscape perspective. So all those design, yeah. it depends, you know, all the design depends. But those are the things you definitely have to think about it, especially bigger project where you know that you have to build a site with structures or retaining walls like this. You may want to consult with um, with the landscape architect, depending on the bigger you know size of the project, because landscape architect are different than building architect. Uh, you know, some architect yeah. smaller project they may be able to do both, but bigger project, even single family construction, you have a different architect, landscape architect and the building architect, right? Um, yeah. so, so those are things probably you wanna, th these are, you're not talking about even landscape, but you have to make sure that your land is stable to build a house, you know? Yep. So those are the things sometimes you may even have to do it to make the ground or area stable before even you build a um, structure, especially if your ground is steep, okay? If it is a steep slope, yeah. Especially a steep slope. A steep slope. And another thing I'm going to share with with um, with our viewer today is something happened to me eight months ago. One of the projects I was doing in McLean, which I did not anticipate, um, because even though this is McLean is already crowded, established neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so we had, this is about 3.3 acre lot. So a little over acre lot, a uh, quarter acre lot, right? Um, yeah. And the house is almost like 8,500 square feet. So it's pretty decent house, a big size house we're building. Then when we start mm -hmm. digging foundation, we realized the existing foundation had um, this infill, infill soil, dirt. So when they mm -hmm. build this old house, maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, somehow the soil and that area was bad because it was really nice, quite lot walk out, very good privacy. And I thought yeah. I hit jackpot, man, it is a perfect place. Now I can get, I can build a new house and, and get the price for this location and the view. Um, and it's a, it's back is a priceless and that neighborhood quite like a 0.3 acre lot yeah. in the green. Um, then when we start digging foundation, we realize soil is really bad. We're keeping down another five, 10 foot, all bad soil. Whoa. So which is now I had to replace all that bad soil with number 57 is stone or is stone 21 or sometimes you can do it. That's added cost now all of a sudden. Okay. Yeah. So and now, what did it end up costing for something like that? Like what kind of a unfortunate. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> the first is almost, almost $2,000 per truck you have to pay and you have to bring a lot of those trucks of gravel to <clears> fill in. And compact it. Okay, so to make sure I'm getting right, your truck math today, it's like 250 to get rid of dirt, but it can dirt, be as much as like 2,000 to bring dirt. No, not the dirt, the stone. Oh. You, you, you cannot just bring okay. yeah, 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 stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah okay. You cannot like, bring a regular the dirt. On getting dirt is quite high. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So um, the, you can okay. bring the dirt, but the problem is then you have to compact it. You cannot just bring the dirt and you know, run the machine, oh, we're good to go. No, that's that's not how you prepare the foundation on infill ground. So it's a process mm -hmm. for a com commercial project. You always do 10, 20 feet of infill if you needed to, but the process is tedious. You know, it's not easy. You have to do every foot. You have to do tests, make sure that ground is properly compacted. So when they build a new structure, well, foundation doesn't settle, okay? So yeah. for residents of construction, building a one house at a time, that's a too costly process. So easy is I'm going to bring a gravel and compact it. Number 57 gravel. 
and 21 is mm -hmm. number 21, and the gravel compacted. So it gives you the same compaction density, but a lot expensive now, right? Of course, your yeah. stone is a lot more expensive than cross the stone is a lot more expensive than dirt. Um, so what tests can you do prior, like during your due diligence period, if you're lucky to even have one, quite honestly, like you during can. Your due diligence, <laughs> what tests can you do? That's, you that's a good question. Okay. And I did, I'm an engineer. I did. Um, yeah. so what I, this is what I have to do that you have to hire a geotechnical engineer to do some soil test. But yeah. the residential construction, people don't pay attention. They don't do it until the country require you to do it. Um, but in my particular case, what happened is that geotechnical is also a friend of mine. Um, he prepared this 30-page uh, report, and he did the three tests. On the back okay. was two of them, one at the front. On the back, it shows the infill. But the dude yeah. didn't tell me because he thought, oh, I sent you the report. You are an engineer. Probably you read it. Dude, I'm getting hundreds of emails a day. <laughs> yeah. I don't have time to read that 50 page report. My engineer said, You should have told me. Oh, I yeah. don't do that. He pointed it out to you. Yeah, dude, that's not good. I was not less happy about it. But now he does. Every time he prepares a report, calls me, Raz, okay, this is what we found. I want to let you know. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. But he didn't tell yeah. me. He, if he had told me, the ball game would be different. Um, but yeah. in the report, it showed up to 10 foot of infill on the back. So Got that's the, okay. the, the drilling they have to do. It's not that expensive. Maybe like five, $600 per drill. They can go down to 20 feet or maybe that 10 to 15 feet down. That's not deep. You know, your basement is not deeper than that anyway. So you don't have to go too much yeah. deep. Um, mm -hmm. and, and like I said, my situation was unlikely, but you never know, right? It's a ground. It's not a uniform. Yeah whole entire region. So this is very wow. segmented area. Um, so that's an additional cost. All of a sudden, if you're a homeowner paying $35,000 over budget, um, as a builder, that is in my contract, I clearly write down when I see situation like this, I'm not responsible. They know it. Builder are not going to pay from their pocket. So yeah, you as homeowner need to pay that $25,000, $35,000, whatever the next it is. Or you are work out right now. You are building a two million dollar homes. Now you are over budget thirty five thousand. You cannot work out right, unfortunately. So no, not at that point. You have already paid your permits and architecture and like you spent a lot of stuff yeah. on non resellable goods, if you will. Like you, sure, architectural plans and a lot you could sell it like that. But the truth is, is is that it at that point backing out of a project over thirty mm -hmm. grand, especially a project of that scope. You yeah. just kind of have to eat the cost or you find another place to make it up. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, for, most, for me, it was a, not a big deal. I, I paid $35,000, but then, I mean, now the market is different. We made a lot more than, because the location is really worth it. So I made like the 10 times more, which is, yeah, the different, but you never know, you know? So those are the yeah. things, the testing you could have done. Talk to a geotechnical engineer. Uh, or civil engineer, and sometimes you have a data of this uh, certain areas, you can pull, um, talk to your civil engineer, the engineer, they would be ab able to share with you. And especially for me, it's a learning, learning, it's a learning um, curve, is that I was talking with my concrete guy, and he said, right, you should have asked me when you buy this plus, because I'm building so many houses in the neighborhood, I know it. See, I could have already asked my contract, hey, I'm building this, Buying this to do, what do you think? Have you, you know, have you seen any unusual stuff in this neighborhood? Mm -hmm. You probably could share and that I would be a little bit more cautious, you know? Sure. And that's why it's so important to have such a good relationship with your vendors and your subcontractors mm -hmm. that work, especially in niche areas a lot, because they have information you would never even expect that could be tremendously valuable to you. Yeah. Um, and that's a really good point. Get to know them talk to them, share information you know with them, they'll mm -hmm. appreciate it and they'll watch out for you. They do. They, it's a teamwork. And also another thing is that uh, high water table, okay? Yeah. So because some places you might have a high water table because your basement, you're digging down to nine foot or 10 foot. Mm -hmm. And if I have a water table and four foot down, the, down, the, uh, down uh, from the ground, then the 
the high water table situation, uh, depending on how worse it is, you may, it's not easy to dig out. And all of a sudden yeah. you have the moist and you have water. Um, and also all that is coming from a geotechnical report because the engineer will tell you, hey, we have a high water table in this area. And you, this is what you can do. When you design foundation system on a high water table system area, you can design it, right? So that's not a problem. It may be a little bit expensive. I can design it as a structural engineer, no problem. But something you have to remember yeah. now, all of a sudden you have a high water table. The water is always there in the rainy time, rainy season, halfway the retaining of the basement wall. Now you have to be very careful about the waterproofing the basement wall, so the water doesn't come inside. It's not yeah. just when it's raining because of the water table, you have to, uh, you know, take additional precaution doing, you know, I would say better insulation, not insulation, insulation plus waterproofing on the basement wall. Yeah, oh, The water sure. may actually come from the slab, not just from the walls. So those are the things now, as I second, we can definitely do it, no problem, but it's gonna cost you another 10 grand. Right, the do money. anything with money. Like with it's, the money, it's, eventually it's the money. The money. Yeah, you can build a house in awesome. Ireland anywhere, you know, in the water, but it's all about money. So I'm talking about your budgeted million all of a sudden, easily 1.2. Uh, but these are the things, do your best, because some of the things that you can do your best, but still you won't be able to cover 100%. There's certain uncertainty uh, part of this, this process and risk involved, but, but it is what it is. But some of the you could be a little bit more careful and try to avoid it, you know, you know, at, at the beginning or early stairs before it's too late. Like I say, when you build a house, already dig out the foundation. You can't say, I, I'm not going to build a house. It's too late, you know. You're already digging. Like, <laughs> you're a little late in the game for this. Yeah, but so. also budget in your budget, make sure you leave room for surprises like that. Like when you dig in the dirt, you don't know what you're going to get like yeah. anything can come up um but you know leave that contingency budget that's why you need to have these little extras ready to go um and if you don't end up using it great you've got money for furniture or like whatever else you're gonna need but definitely leave room in the budget for things for those kinds of surprises for because, sure yeah when i talk to especially homeowners clients they are trying to build spec homes or building custom homes I told them, please make sure you have at least a 10% contingency. Um, yeah. Even the bank, they know it. If you go to the bank, if I submit my construction cost, they're gonna put down the 10% contingency on the loan because they know that that may happen, right? Like yeah. say, if you need it to it's at least- It's guaranteed have, to happen. <laughs> it, almost, exactly. So if you don't need the money, that's okay. You don't have to take it out from the bank, but if you need it, then you don't have to stop the whole project at least you have money there yeah. to complete the project and think about it in paying paying off later one but at least you can finish the project now yeah oh for sure yeah 100 yeah. percent. okay so is there anything else about soil that's really important to know like in northern virginia clay is kind of the name of the game but you can have different yeah. types of soil yeah. Um, are there any other common soil types here that can be problematic if someone were to do like a soil test on a property they're thinking about, like anything that they should be aware of? You know, I'm, I'm not a geotechnical engineer or soil engineer, but I know that clay soil is a bad, there's certain part of uh, Arlington, you have all clay, it's really bad because the clay soil yeah. in the winter time, summertime or rainy season, always bad because um, so that's always bad <laughs> always bad because like i said i tell you when mm. it's in the rainy season it's like a muddy like it's like you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. when you dig out yep. and it retains the water clay a lot of people think of clay and they think of like um dried out clay which happens in the summer it gets very yeah. dry and it can it be like it's like stone like at that point or brick like yes but when it's wet it's like sludge. <laughs> and, That's the word, uh, yeah. Pudding. <laughs> um, and it's totally different. And you have the same soil, you're trying to have that year round. So if you have a very saturated soil too in the winter, like right now, probably most of our ground is frozen. Maybe not today, because yeah. it's sporadically 50 something degrees. But three days ago, it was 28 degrees and 19 degrees when we woke up. 
So that kind of a swing too, that means I, this is one of those days where if I had to go to a construction site, I would absolutely be wearing boots. Boots that I can hose off when I get home because the ground, the grass, all of it is going to be super gross. Yeah. You know, and building in that is very challenging because of, you know, yes. uh, we have all four seasons here in uh, D the DC area, Northern Virginia. And uh, depending on the type of year, time of year, building a basement, I think is going to be a much bigger challenge than uh, maybe in some other parts of the year. Like, what do, well, what do you think about that? Like, when's the best time to build a basement if you had to? <laughs> what is your preferable season for basements? So two things you have to, you have to remember, um, because we have a topic coming soon, is uh, structural problems in the house. Some of the common structural problems. Ah. Then we have foundation problems. And we'll talk about this clay soil, how clay soil could be very problematic on, mm -hmm. on having structural problems on the foundation down the road, okay? In the winter yeah. time, summer time, every time, I'll explain that that time. So, but if you have it, so you have to remember when you pour a footing, the ground has to be in dry and it has to be fully compacted, right? Because if you, yeah. like you say, if you are digging the foundation and your your soil is clay and it's like a slaw, right? it, it's not it's not dry enough. You cannot just pour the wall or footing on it. You know what I'm saying? It's not stable. So, so no. anything bad soil, when you pour a foundation, any bad soil you have to replace with the gravel, or you have to dig out all of them, throw it away until you find that good soil. So that, throw it away for two hundred and fifty bucks a truckload. <laughs> two hundred fifty, yeah, and maybe sometime wow. if it's bad soil, at least one they even charge you more because the clay is bad. So nobody wants to take it. So the, the problem is, <laughs> is all clay. They're probably gonna charge you more. To be honest with you. Because they have to, they wow. can't just take it and dump it. They have to take it to the place and where they actually have to pay, you know? The soil so, farm, where soil goes to live well, the rest of its life. Soil farm, yeah. But exactly. So, so like I say, <laughs> this is what you do. When you dig a footing or foundation, when we find it, the bad soil, you have to dig it down until you find the stable soil. So, yeah. you know, we, we talked about this one before. In our area, you have a frost depth of 24 inch to 30 inch of frost depth. But yep. that's the minimum you have to do. But once you dig the footing and find out the soil is not good, you may have to go down to three foot, four foot. I have done it. Yeah. So you, you can't just pour it. Oh, I'm down to 30 inch or 24 inch. I'm good with frost there, but soil is not good. You can't do it. So two things you yeah. happen, you know, especially foundation, you have to do the concrete part. The concrete part is if it is pouring concrete, in the winter is not really good, right? Even though in our area, we are pouring concrete all 20, you know, 12 months a year. There is no stopping point. Um, yeah. But if if the concrete, you pour the concrete in, in a too cold temperature, it cannot gain the strength um, to the extent it's supposed to within a certain period mm -hmm. of time because it's too cold, okay? So what we do here is to expedite that process, we mix the chemicals it's a super plasticizer with chemicals into the concrete to give enough heat huh. yeah we do and they're gonna charge you in the winter time keep in mind the concrete company will charge you additional to pour concrete bring a concrete in the winter time because they have to add that additional chemical but again for me as a structural engineer adding chemical you know you're trying to do artificial thing to happen so that it will work you know that's not always like real thing right yeah. So for me, if I have to build a house for myself, I usually don't want to pour in when it's too cold, especially if it yeah. is a colder than 30 degree or, you know, it says it has to be about 40, 40 39 to 40 degree high, but in winter time, you don't get that, right? Not recently, we haven't gotten that for sure. You, you don't. But like come March, April, May, like by May, it's 80 degrees here. So That's okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. We do it here all the time, but this is what happened. You see all the bigger construction we do, commercial project, all that's a different because they have resources, they have money. When they pour footing or concrete, they have, they control, they cover with, uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, a tarp or something and you have a heated floor. They're trying, you know, they're, they're doing all that additional precaution to make sure that yeah. concrete is, is cured 
properly, but you can't really spend that much of money doing that for residential construction. I have not seen any builder done it, right? Um, so yeah. I've seen many problems in concrete cracks in, you know, especially concrete cracks in the winter time, the house built in winter time, um, yeah. and not being careful about all those mixing properly is you will see a lot of cracks if you pour the walls or concrete footings in the winter time. Uh, That's good to know. What unfortunately yeah. we have a pretty short winter here yeah. in like our area. So there, there's really not a ton of the year. You're really only looking at maybe two months where it's truly too cold, or maybe you would really can reconsider um, whether or not it is worth pouring your concrete or not. Maybe three months, but I think that's kind of even a stretch. It, this has been a particularly cold winter. It's not usually yeah. this cold, but that's good to know that if you were to pour it, like you stand a much better chance of this cracking um, long term, and you're you're spending a lot of money. <laughs> Like yeah. your walls and you and your foundation, you may just want to say, "Hey, what are the carrying costs for these two or three months? What if we did this at the end of March or maybe the beginning of April when it's just not so cold? Um, what kind of benefits could that have versus the cost of waiting and things like that?" Um, so that is great. That's a great tip. It's good to know. You know, especially as a home a homeowner and you're trying to build this house. Um, yeah, if you can wait for a couple of months, I would suggest to wait. But doesn't mean that yeah. you can't build a house in the winter. Everybody's doing it. Specs home builder like me, I can't wait yeah. two months. You know, I have to keep going. You know, so but exactly. again, when you do it, be careful. Talk to your concrete contractor. Make sure you don't have issue down the road. Um, like I said, any uh, cracking issue I have happened on my house, I have built is the ones I typically pour in the winter time. Um, you will see, especially in the basement slab, you see a lot of cracks. We talked about this one before. The concrete is supposed to crack. It will crack. Okay? So it, yeah. it will get no matter what. But you, you really have to be careful about what you want to crack, right? If you have too much crack and too big crack, that's and that affects your structural integrity of the building or structural uh, member or component like walls and footing, you can't have a crack. So then the basement, yeah. if you give you an example, a big slab, if you pour it, you see a lot of cracks all over. So what we do is we cut the top half inch of the slab in pattern. Yeah. So that what happened, you are actually telling oh. concrete to crack where you cut it. So you, don't you have want it to crack. What you want it to crack. So you don't have this ugly hair line crack all over throughout even though you're going to cover this with, uh, you know, carpet or flooring. But yeah. so when you open it, it's not good feeling. So there's few yeah. things you can do to prevent it. Um, but if it's really structural crack and things like that, especially basement wall, if you have a crack like that, it's not a structural. The water from outside, the back of the house may come in. So all of a sudden, it's structural issue and also seepage issue, water seepage issue. So now, two yeah. problems at the same time. <laughs> Which is never a good thing. Never a good thing. Never and good thing. this is definitely not a cheap thing necessarily to fix either. No, it's not. No. Well, no, not. this is, but this has been a great start, I think, to our new series. And I'm really excited for this um, because I think we're going to continue to get a lot of questions on how do I estimate uh, what this could cost and how these things go. So if you have any questions, um, please do leave them in the comments and Raj and I are going to try to incorporate that into our future episodes and uh, let us know if you have any questions uh, about anything we talked about today because we'd love to be able to answer uh, via Facebook as well. So we will see you guys again next week uh, to talk about um, wall footings, brick ledges, basement wall height. We're going to go in much more in depth of what we started talking about today with basements um and flooring and framing height and estimating those costs so uh, next week we're going to be talking about a pretty hefty topic that i think a lot of people have questions for so we will see you guys next week uh and look forward to it again thanks Raj. thank you so much bye bye thanks Bye.